should be a picture of a, a haystack with a pin, a needle stuck in it, because that is the ideal court interpreter you're looking for, is a needle in a haystack. And we're going to talk about good, better, and best interpreters and good, better, and best places to find them so that you can make a more informed decision next time a need comes up, whether it's for Spanish like usual or whether it's for one of the hundreds of less common languages that are sometimes appearing in courts and more and more so. In Texas, according to the last census figures, one in seven people is not fluent enough in English to appear before a judge without the help of an interpreter. So this is a huge group of people that we're talking about. And if it hasn't happened to you yet in your court, it will soon. So I'll just jump right in. If, uh, if you have a question as we go, you're welcome to put it in the chat or just hold it to the end or take yourself off mute and ask. I don't care. I want this to be an informal conversation, just a brown bag discussion. So the two main approaches to finding a court interpreter are through an agency or directly. Going through an agency, meaning a commercial uh, interpretation company. It might be a local, a regional, or a national agency. Um, those are also called LSPs, language services providers. And they do most of the work for you, but you have to pay them extra to be the middleman. The other option, and this is mostly what we'll be talking about today, is uh, doing it directly. That means that you are your own agency. It means that you're searching through the registries and listings and associations and trying to track down somebody who has the appropriate skills and qualifications and is available on the date you need him or her and has a budget that you can afford. And usually it's cheaper to be your own agency and go directly, but it's more work. And I want to add a caveat down at the bottom. I have a couple of websites for the national and state laws that have to do with interpretation. I'm not going to get into that today. I'm just going to assume you've already decided you need a qualified judiciary interpreter for this hearing. And where do you find this person? If you want to find out um, what the rules and regulations are, I'd recommend you consult those two sites down there. And I will be emailing this PowerPoint out to all attendees afterwards with hyperlinks that you can click on. So starting, we'll get the commercial companies, the businesses out of the way first. Um, I would recommend starting with any local agency. If you're in a major metro area, there are probably interpreting agencies there that know your community and have uh, people who have interpreted in your courts before. After that, you could look at a regional agency, two that I've heard of, and I'm not endorsing any of these are TIN in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and Masterword in the Houston area, but they both cover the entire state. And they will vet the interpreters and provide somebody with the right qualifications and the right language pair for your needs. Uh, there are also tons of national companies and international companies, too, that are well known in the legal space, are Language Line Solutions and Lion Bridge. And so any of these companies can provide an interpreter for you, some of them on site, but all of them are doing remote interpreting now by phone and video conferencing. So directly, um, going directly to a freelance interpreter and hiring him or her yourself has certain advantages. You're not paying the costs of project management or the middleman. You get to control which freelancer is actually appearing in your court. You can get the same interpreter for each setting. If you have a case that stretches over months with multiple hearings, it's an advantage to have an interpreter come in who is there for the last hearing and is familiar with the terminology and the people involved. And you can often find the most experienced interpreters because as interpreters get better and better, they like agencies less and less. They prefer to work directly for the courts and the law firms and the court reporting agencies. Um, rather than going through the agencies, the agencies put certain restrictions on interpreters having to do with non-compete clauses and um, so forth. The disadvantages of going directly are that you have to screen them for their qualifications, and often it's for a language you have no familiarity with, so it's hard to know, is this person really going to do the job well? If the interpreter cancels, it's a sole proprietor, and so there's no backup. There's no uh, sub that can step in unless that interpreter has colleagues that, that can uh, take over. And the rarer the languages, the more work this will be, chiefly because the interpreters in languages of limited diffusion often don't have enough work to do it full time. And so they are also professors or accountants or surgeons or something else. And only on the side, once in a while, they do interpretation. And as a result, they're not in any of the major directories or associations. 
So tracking down your freelancer directly, I put sort of a, a hit list here on order of precedence. I would uh, highly recommend that you start at the top and then work your way down to the bottom. And the first stop will be the Judicial Branch Certification Commission, the JBCC, at the Texas Office of Court Administration. And we'll go into each one of these in more detail, so I'm just summarizing now. Next, there are a couple of national and state associations of judiciary interpreters. And there's a, a national association of translators that also includes a lot of interpreters, but the two uh, professions are different. Then there are several regional associations around Texas and in other states. There are lots of nonprofits that need interpreters, and so they've developed their own list, sometimes volunteers, sometimes semi-pro or professional. And you can sometimes go through one of those associations to get referred to a good interpreter. And then there are several other online resources that I'll mention at the end. So I've arranged uh, from green at the top, which is the best, down to red at the bottom, which is uh, danger, danger, uh, the different levels of proficiency in freelance interpreters for legal settings. A professional judiciary interpreter that's full-time will probably give you the best results. A part-timer will probably give you pretty good results if he or she still has the training and the credentials. Then um, under judiciary interpreters, a uh, sort of related field is conference interpreters. And these are the people who sit with headphones on during uh, UN meetings and all kinds of conferences around the world. And they are usually good interpreters, well-trained, and they can keep up with um, fast speech, but they may not be familiar with the legal setting. And so they could struggle with some of the terminology and understanding the concepts being discussed in court. Then under that, we have professional medical interpreters um, who are uh, very good interpreters. They have their own credentialing and training process. But um, again, the uh, not only is the terminology unfamiliar to them, but the procedures are different. The, the ethical rules and the protocols are different in a medical setting than they are in a court setting. And then after that, we have other experienced interpreters, like these are people who might interpret in a school setting or social services. And they, they are good interpreters in that um, setting, but would need uh, extra prep to get ready for a court setting. And then finally, bilingual people. And I wanted to spell the, the myth that anybody who's bilingual can interpret, especially in a, in a court setting. And it's just most bilingual people are strong in their dominant language, and then they speak their other language pretty well in certain situations. Very few of them can um, use both languages in a legal setting, and very few of them have the uh, have practiced the memory skills and the analysis skills that go into keeping up quickly with speech in one language and converting it live into the second language and then spitting it out while still listening to it in the first language. And that kind of uh, mental gymnastics uh, takes a lot more um, training and experience than your average bilingual person has had the opportunity to develop. So. What you get when you hire a professional, uh, professional judiciary interpreters understand what's going on in court. And if you've been working in the courts for a long time, you may have forgotten. But at the beginning, I know my head was just spinning. I didn't know who all these people were and what they were talking about and where I was supposed to go and what I was supposed to do. And most people who um, appear in court uh, for the first time feel just as confused and overwhelmed and scared, and that has a, a real impact on their ability to communicate effectively. A professional is responsive to communication, is reliable in terms of scheduling and invoicing, and a, a professional is honest about issues, like if she's having trouble hearing or if she's unfamiliar with a certain aspect of the law, um, she will speak up about that. She'll be respectful of the confidentiality of the information obtained um, in privileged conversations and will also be impartial. And this is a big one when you have, say, the grandson interpret for the grandma or the uh, uh, brother-in-law interpret for the, the defendant. Um, there's often uh, either overt or, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, implied uh, partiality. The person has some outcome, uh, some stake in the outcome of the case, and a professional interpreter is trained and um, experienced at remaining totally impartial and interpreting the same way no matter which uh, client is paying him or her. And also, perhaps most importantly, is just keeping up with legalese at normal spoken speeds. And 
I listed some words down here that I had to learn when I became a judiciary interpreter that were new to me and probably everybody on this call, I'm looking at your, your job listings over here on the poll, probably everybody on this call can explain these words and use them in a sentence in the legal context, but uh, an, an interpreter who hasn't been in court before will just not know what to make of these or will uh, make um, go to the first um, translation that pops into his head, like sentence, use the word that just means a sentence of text, information, use the standard word for information, discovery, use the word that means, you know, Columbus discovering the new world, rather than the, the, the legal term in the other language that's more accurate. And I'd like to pause just for a second and uh, welcome a, uh, an ASL interpreter that we have joined us today, Carrie Barrett. Thank you for coming, Carrie. I don't do sign language, and I don't have the answers to questions about sign language interpretation, but Carrie does. She's excellent and um, highly professional experience. So as we're going along, if you have questions that relate to sign language, uh, she'll be available to answer those. And I Hello, really everybody. Yeah, so I'm here if you have a question. Thank you, Carrie. So um, now we're going to look at where you find these professional interpreters. The first stop in Texas is the Judicial Branch Certification Commission. And this is a state agency that also regulates the court reporters and process servers and the guardians. And they use an exam developed by the National Center for State Courts, which is a very difficult written and oral exam that most people fail when they try to take it. Lots of bilingual people, 90% of the bilingual people who try to take the uh, exam can't pass it. The oral exam, the written exam is easier, but it tests you over three different modes of interpreting, which are called consecutive, simultaneous, and sight. And so people who make it onto this listing have demonstrated their skills. And right now there's about 500 court interpreters on there. Maybe 90% of those are for Spanish and the rest are in these languages shown right here. So if you have a language um, that's on this list, then definitely start with that JBCC licensed interpreter and try to book him or her. If it's not on this list, then you have to work your way down the, the priorities and, and look elsewhere for that provider. I'm going to uh, switch sharing for a minute and just show you what the website looks like when you are looking up a licensee on the JBCC listing. Um, you'll go to texascourts.gov, and these links again are all in the PowerPoint, you don't have to write them down, and scroll down to where it says access, this red button here, access the JBC certification registration and licensing system, and you'll come to a search menu um, where you can search by name or certification type, but you can't search by language. And I think this is a, was a real curious choice on the developer's part um, that about all these different languages, um, you, there's no way to find it unless you generate the entire list. And so I think the, the quickest way to track down somebody um, by language is to uh, click on this button here that says generate Excel and then download a big Excel spreadsheet. And I will switch over to that window now. Let me know if you're not able to see my Excel spreadsheet. When you download it, I downloaded this one a few months ago, but it'll look basically like this. It gives the name, and then the second column it mentions the language, and then contact information. So if I got to this point and I was trying to find a Farsi interpreter, I would hit Control F in Excel and type Farsi, and it will scroll down and show me there is Michael H. Almasi, and then I click Find Next, and it looks like he is the only Farsi interpreter in Texas. Okay, what if I was looking for Russian? Find Next, there is Alexander Vladir Vladimirovich Lukov, and Alina Vladimirovna Spradley, and Ksenia Lee. Okay, so there's three of those. So in the case of Farsi, you would just email or call this guy and uh, describe the setting and ask if he's available. In the case of Russian, you might um, email all three of them at once and see which one responds first and then try to negotiate. If you have a certain budget that you're working in and you want to make sure you don't go over that, then you might um, ask for a quote from each one of them because each of these are 
uh, freelancers and sole proprietors and they each set their own uh, per hour rate or sometimes it's a half day rate or a full day rate. Uh, depending on the type of hearing, you might need two interpreters. If it's um, over a certain amount of time, then interpreters trade off back and forth and interpret as a team. And it might make a difference whether you want to do it in person or remotely um, through video conferencing or phone. And so there's just a lot of details to negotiate, negotiate and you want to discuss that with the interpreter beforehand, find out what the cancellation fee is. Most interpreters will have a 24-hour cancellation or a 48-hour cancellation policy or for a whole trial it might be a one-week cancellation and if you cancel within that amount of time then they charge the cancellation fee to cover the risk that they will not be able to replace that job in the short remaining time that's left. And those, those policies and fees are all over the place. So if you can find somebody from the JVCC, great. Start there. If you can't, then the next uh, place to go are the associations of judiciary interpreters and translators. I would start with Texas, even though it's much smaller, it's 120 members. These are mostly licensed court interpreters and they're mostly familiar with the Texas court system and terminology that will come up in a Texas court. If not, there are people all over the country who will um, do a fine job uh, who are listed in Najit, um, who may not be listed in other sources. So the a way that you search for these is similar. Let me switch back to my browser and show you an example. Um, let's see. I'll do uh, tagit.org. You go to directory and you can choose your language over here in the left. Let's say you need Chinese Mandarin. You click on that. And you see here is a person that offers uh, many languages representing uh, master word services, which I mentioned earlier. Here is a sole proprietor and a freelance interpreter. And here's another one with email addresses and phone numbers. If you can't find anyone in Najit and you want to go out to the, I mean in Tajit, and you want to go out to the national organization, Najit.org is the address. And You'll click on find a professional in the top right hand corner and then fill out a little form member search and you'll get a larger number of interpreters for that language and you can also review their qualifications now because you're going outside of the state of Texas at this point I would encourage you to spend a little more time uh, evaluating what uh, skills they have. Let's, let's go with something kind of uh, different here. Arabic interpreter. I'm going to put it to court slash legal. I'll leave all of the geographic spaces blank. Um, all members. And first I want to see the people who are state certified uh, or equivalent. Qualify you. Now let's just do everybody. See, cast a wide net and see what we can find. And it's churning away in the background, churning, churning, churning. Here we go. So any any listing that has a lot of languages uh, is uh, an organization, an agency. If it just has a couple languages and a person's picture, that's probably a freelancer. Um, I would see they're, they're in California, New York, Albuquerque. If you want somebody to come in person, you might want to start with um, people in surrounding states so the travel expenses will be lower. And we've got a lot of hits here. It's just the first page and the second page, too, for Arabic. For a language like Arabic, uh, be careful that you choose the right dialect. Arab Arabic has uh, vast differences between, say, the way it's spoken in Morocco versus Egypt versus Bahrain versus Lebanon. And if your defendant is from one of those areas and only speaks the colloquial dialect, then you need to find an interpreter who's familiar with that. Otherwise, it'll be like um, they will struggle to understand each other. I would say Arabic and, and then Chinese. There are several languages of China, so make sure that the Chinese uh, is the same language and the same dialect of the language spoken by both. OK, back to our PowerPoint. So if you can't find anybody in Tajit or Najit, my next stop would be the American Translators Association. And 
Uh, just in case you didn't know, a translator works in written language, an interpreter works in sign language or spoken languages. And so you don't really want a translator. These are people who sit at a computer and type words in, a, in another language, and they have a lot of the linguistic skills that an interpreter has. But um, translators generally don't like interpreting, and it's uh, overwhelming, and they, aren't, they haven't developed those muscles in their brain to be able to do it and keep up with it quickly. And interpreters usually don't like translating because it's sort of a different personality type and a different uh, work environment. But in the ATA, there are also a lot of interpreters, and there are some people who do both translation and interpretation. So if you were headed for the ATA directory, I will show you what their search options look like. It's atanet.org. Again, these links will be in your PowerPoint. Click on the green Find a Language Professional button. I'm going to search individuals. And I'm going to click on Interpreter and search by, search by language. Let's say I need an interpreter in English and to Ukrainian, that might be coming up more and more in the coming months. Interpreter search, interpreting modes, interpreting methods, services, legal, and court. And I'm going to find one who is credentialed in legal. So that'll probably be the state credential, but for any state. I've got to tell them I'm not a robot because apparently robots can't click with a mouse. And I got two um, Ukrainian English court interpreters. And so these, Karl Marx, really? Huh, sounds like a pseudonym. <laughs> um, so these would be the two that you'd want to start with. Contact her and him and negotiate um, whether remote appearance is possible or in person or whatever. So again, this is the American Translators Association. Um, oh. And I just realized that I wasn't sharing my screen that whole time. I'm so sorry. Um, this is the browser window that shows the hits for the ATA and the two Ukrainian court interpreters that I came up with. So let's say you search through and you find two uh, court interpreters with a state credential for Ukrainian. You contact both of them. Neither of them are available at your hearing, but you have to have the hearing by a certain date for statutory reasons. Then you could remove the um, court interpreter credential and um, cast a wider net and see what kind of credentials are available and who is your next best option. Or you could put it out to a, an agency and let them use their other resources to try to find you a good candidate. All right, so after the ATA, we have some regional interpreter associations, and the first five are for different major metro areas around Texas, and then outside of Texas, there are lots of similar organizations around the country. And these are often uh, the same people that you'll find in the other directories, but it's also some part-timers who have a little bit of money to invest in joining an association, but they can't afford the fees for the larger national associations, and so for 30 or 40 or 50 bucks a year, they join one of these local associations and they get their listing online and they're able to get a little bit of work on the side while they do something else full time. And so um, often the uh, interpreters who are in these um, listings will have some experience in the Texas court system and it's, it's hit or miss. You have to go through and, and read their listings and then contact them to find out exactly what they know how to do and what their qualifications are. So next, if you can't find anybody who is listed with one of the professional associations for interpreters, I would try a variety of nonprofits and governmental organizations who are fellow users of interpreters. And they often have their own in-house listing of interpreters that they've trained or that they've used in the past. And when you get down to this level, these are usually not uh, licensed court interpreters or certified interpreters but uh, they do cover more languages. And so these will often be people who um, are immigrants from another country and they speak the, the home language well and they've lived in the US long enough to speak English well and they've interpreted at maybe asylum hearings, maybe for medical appointments, maybe they've just helped uh, new parents enroll their children in US schools. And so they will need 
uh, more support than a professional court interpreter. It'll be even more important to provide them with information about the case beforehand so that they can research the terminology that comes up. You might want to invite interpreters like this to observe a hearing in your court before the actual day of the hearing or the trial so they get a feel for the protocol so they can ask questions and take notes and um, it will help them with their nerves too when they get up there before the judge for the first time. But I just put up a few that I've heard of and there's tons around the state depending on where you're dialing in from, dialing in, connecting from. And one of them we have here in Austin is called Asian Family Support Services of Austin, Refugee Services of Texas, all of the various legal aid organizations. And then the three that I have at the bottom have programs that might be of assistance. The State Bar of Texas um, has something called, oh, what is it? Let me click on this. Um, the Language Access Fund. And the Language Access Fund is for attorneys who are representing limited English proficient clients pro bono, and it's a pot of money to help with uh, translation and interpretation needs. Um, so if you work for a court system, this wouldn't help you directly. But the National Center for State Courts is that organization that created our credentialing exam and also the federal level exam. And they have a nice page, uh, which is hyperlinked here. Let me show you. That's just full of resources all about um, court interpreting. And it has a link to the program in every state. So I think I switched over to my Chrome window now. Um, it's got FAQs, uh, training materials, overviews of the exam. Uh, resources for administrators and if you say you're in Texas but you're near the Louisiana border and you're wondering are there any Louisiana credentialed court interpreters who would come over here and cover this hearing because I can't find anybody in Texas then you could um, go through this resource to find out the website of the directory for Louisiana or for I don't know if Oklahoma has one New Mexico does and go across state boundaries and find a qualified legal interpreter there. Again, there are certain restrictions um, based on state law on who's allowed to interpret in different settings. So I remember my caveat at the beginning about doing your due diligence there. OK, back to the PowerPoint. Um, the last uh, item on the list here is the Texas Court Remote Interpreter Service. And I used to work for this department at the Office of Court Administration. And this is a an office in Austin that has licensed court interpreters for Spanish that are standing by to take calls from judges around the state and interpret in certain uh, smaller non-evidentiary hearings for free. Um, it comes out of the OCA budget, not your local budget. So I imagine most of you have heard about TCRIS, but if not, that's worth looking into and finding out uh, when it can help you. And they do Spanish in-house, but then last time I heard they outsource Spanish to uh, remote interpretation service. Finally, there are other websites, and we're working our way down from the from the best to the better to the good. Uh, you can just Google Farsi Court Interpreter, for example, and there are Farsi interpreters out there who have their own website, and you can contact them through that. And some of them are not a member of any association, but still are qualified uh, judiciary interpreters on LinkedIn. Same thing, just as in every profession, court interpreters uh, put a LinkedIn listing up there and describe uh, their background and experience and sometimes a resume. Pros or pro Z, nobody's quite sure how to pronounce it. It seems to be controversial. But let me show you what this looks like. Uh, new share. This is a sort of a clearinghouse for translators and interpreters, mostly translators around the world, but it's got tens of thousands of interpreters on here. And so if you're going through pros to try to find an interpreter, you would put in your languages, let's just say English to French, and you choose uh, in both directions. Like in a court setting, you usually need to go both ways. In a conference setting, you might be going in just one direction. But they have 285 members who go two ways, English and French. Um, if you're looking for somebody who can do video, they have 22 members in their listings. And then you just start going through and reading the description, see where they are, see what their um, abilities are, make sure it's somebody who's familiar with 
the legal context and has worked in U.S. courts, and you could um, try to hire somebody off of prose. I'm a little bit leery of prose. I feel it's kind of like Craigslist of interpreters, but you know, I've gotten some, some good used furniture off of Craigslist too, so I won't knock it. Um, and then, let's see, back to our slide here. Go Signify is an interesting project. This was started by a Spanish court interpreter here in Texas. And it's, uh, I hope you won't mind me describing it this way, but it's a little bit like an Uber or a Thumbtack, but for court interpreters. And the idea is to get interpreters to sign up and to eliminate the need for an agency by using technology to play the role of the agency and allowing you in the courts or in the law firms to hire somebody through GoSignify and pay through GoSignify. And so um, if you want to check that out, I don't know what stage of development it's currently at, but probably it's going to be uh, the, the trend of the future. Probably more and more interpreters are going to be working through online marketplaces like GoSignify um, to try to be more competitive and eliminate some of the expenses because, as you all know, hiring an interpreter is very expensive. And then finally, Last but not least, university language departments. There are professors working around the country teaching languages who are also interpreters, who are qualified to interpret, but do it so rarely that, that they're hard to find outside of the university website. So for an obscure language, um, that might be where you end up going, finding an interpreter who's willing to join a call and interpret sometimes for a fee, sometimes as a public service. So. I want to give some general rule of thumbs. Let's see, it looks like we're making good time. Um, I would say, and this is just me talking from my own experience. This is, uh, I'm sure other people will tell you differently, but most bi bilingual people don't interpret. Interpreting, it's sort of like, you know, if you're, if you're gonna race in the Indy 500, you want to make sure you get a car that's really fast and a driver who's been in races before, and there are lots of cars out there, but most cars are not suitable for a high-speed race. And uh, all interpreters are bilingual, but not all bilinguals are interpreters. And so the, there's a, an unfortunate reality that a lot of people who are pressed into service interpreting in the courts, and in Texas courts too, are just the only bilingual person that the staff could find or that the judge knew. and if you've been in those settings, you probably have come to realize that a lot of information is not being communicated between the parties. Rule of thumb number two, a qualified interpreter next week is better than an unqualified interpreter now, unless you have other deadlines that, that are inflexible. I would always recommend waiting until you can find a good interpreter. A qualified interpreter by phone or a video conference is better than an unqualified interpreter in person. So if the only interpreter who speaks Quiche is going to be calling in from Los Angeles and you have somebody here in town who, you know, spent a summer working in a Quiche speaking village and knows how to make small talk, wait until you can get the person in LA who's the qualified interpreter. And an interpreter in person, in general, all things being equal, is better than an interpreter by video conference and video conference is better than by phone only. And you know, it's just like the difference in having a conversation with anybody by phone. It's easier to misunderstand. There are more things that can go wrong with dropped calls or poor audibility, and you're missing out on a lot of nonverbal communication that you get when you're in person side by side. So try to get someone in person when possible. And that concludes my presentation. Here's my contact information. Um, I'm going to open the floor now. Uh, to comments and questions, and I'm also going to put up my other poll. Uh, here are the results of our first poll, mostly court coordinators and administrators, followed by interpreters or translators, judges or other judicial officers, and a court reporter. All right, thank you. And then my second poll, i just like to get some feedback on session. See if I can launch this. Whole pandemic, and I still don't know how to use Zoom. 
There we go. Nope, I don't know how to launch a second poll. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I can ask the same questions in an email. I'll be following up with an email, and you're welcome to reply to that if you have any questions. Uh, Carrie, since you are still here with us, can you uh, give us like a little um, one-minute summary of uh, where people go to find ASL interpreters? I'd love to. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, are we talking to most everybody in Texas, or we have some people out of Texas? I believe everybody's in Texas here. Great. So the most important thing that I can let you know is nothing is valid in court unless you get an interpreter that holds one of two qualifications. One of them is the Texas Board of Evaluation of Interpreters court certification. And the second is the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf um, special certificate legal. And so it's really quite easy to find one of us, although there's only like 130 of us in the whole state. Um, I always recommend Googling public BEI registry. And when you get there, you can search by county and certificate type, and you're gonna wanna put court in there. And when you go to the RID list, you can search by state and then look for somebody that holds an SCL. And um, that's how you find us. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, oftentimes there's a little bit of confusion between spoken language interpreters and sign language interpreters, and in that there are special provisions in the code for spoken language interpreters when you can't find somebody who's on the um, licensed list or through any of the organizations that Marco just shared with you. Um, when you're looking for one, the judge can appoint a spoken language interpreter in a radius um, with a population that's less than a certain number of people in the county. And so somebody who's not a professional interpreter can function as one in the court. That provision does not apply to sign language interpreters and interpreters for the deaf. So often somebody will say, well, I live close by, I know the sign language, I can come and do this. But if they're not a holder of either one of those two certificates, then the proceedings are invalid. So I just wanted to, I love the opportunity to put that in front of people whenever I can, because it's a little known fact, I guess, and then things get in trouble because we don't abide by it. So Carrie, if my teenager is taking ASL in high school, that's not good enough? It's she not. She interpret in court. <laughs> hmm, maybe. <laughs> oh my God. I, I will help her get her certificate. And then help me. Two more gonna, years. Few more years, a little bit more experience. Um, right. that's a, it's a problem. We hear it often, and uh, people will contact an interpreting agency, and of course, the agency wants to fill a job, so they'll be like, "Yeah, I'll send somebody right over." But I always suggest double the certificate of the interpreter that that comes in. Thank you. <laughs>